Thanks for joining us. You've tuned into Arirang's Within the Frame. I'm Handan in Seoul. As the U.S. presidential election draws closer, former president and Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump looms large on issues surrounding the South Korea-U.S. alliance. He recently hinted at possible withdrawal of U.S. troops from the Korean Peninsula if South Korea doesn't expand support. And the impact of his comments is reverberating across Seoul. Let's talk more about this and its possible ramifications with Pan Gil-ju, research professor at Korea University's Ilmin International Relations Institute, who joins us via Skype. It's so great to have you with us. Good evening. Pleased to be here. And for a voice straight from Washington, we also have VOA correspondent Jessica Stone joining us tonight. It's always a pleasure to Good have evening. you with us. Let's kick things off with you, Jessica. So former President Trump has rekindled his criticism over South Korea U.S. defense cost sharing, saying U.S. forces are defending wealthy South Korea, quote unquote, free of charge. Why do you think such remarks came now? What could be his possible motives? Well, this is uh, six months out from the election right here in the United States. And he gave an interview to Time magazine and he was asked for points of commonality between his previous presidency and points of contrast. And this is really um, part of an interview in which he talked about uh, something that is not very different from the positions he took four years ago. <clears throat> According to the article, Trump raises the question, as he did four years ago, of what Seoul needs to do to deter Pyongyang. And his answer, pay more for the U.S. troops on the peninsula. He also claims falsely that the U.S. has 40,000 troops on the peninsula. In fact, there are about 2,800, excuse me, 28,500 troops. But this position is really not a surprise. Uh, he took a very similar position four years ago. Uh, so uh, that is a point of consistency and a point of concern, as we understand, for the South Korean public. Right. It's not the first time that uh, Trump has made a similar remarks. Uh, now, let's take the chance to look into the details of the South Korea U.S. defense cost sharing talks, formerly called the Special Measures Agreement or the SMA. Uh, Professor Pan, what rules or guidelines is the SMA based on and how do you assess the level of Korea's contribution? Well, to start with, uh, the origin of defense cost sharing traces back to the mutual defense treaty between the Republic of Korea and the United States, which was signed in 1953. Article 4 of the defense treaty states that the Republic of Korea grants and the United States of America accepts the right to dispose United States land, air, and sea forces in and about the territory of the Republic of Korea as determined by mutual agreement. This article was clarified through the Rock U.S. Status of Forces Agreement called SOFA in 1966. Article 5, the SOFA states, the U.S. bears all associated expenditures, which means the United States raises the money needed for the U.S. forces in Korea to maintain. Meanwhile, in the 1980s, as the U.S. faced financial challenges and its allies developed their economies, the United States began to ask for a defense cost sharing. So, as you mentioned earlier, SMA was signed between South Korea and the United States for the first time in 1991 to determine how much South Korea shares for defense costs. The last SMA came into force on 1 September 2021, which was based on the 11th agreement. In short, South Korea has made a financial contribution to American troops in Korea since, in, since 1991. Meanwhile, Defense cost sharing is made under three components, including labor cost, South Korea funded construction, and logistics cost. Under the SMA procedure, South Korea and the United States uh, determine the total amount of contribution through negotiation based on several factors, such as American troops' contribution to defense of Korea, South Korea's capabilities, and the security situation. As of 2021, South Korea provided the United States with about 1.2 trillion won. In addition to direct contributions funded by South Korea's government, South Korea also provides with the United States with indirect contributions, such as tax exemption. So as of 2021, a total contribution was estimated more than 3 trillion won. Furthermore, South Korea shares defense costs 
now under the Biden administration more than under the Trump administration. To top it off, South Korea contributed more than 90% of the money to construct the new military base, Camp Humphrey, Humphreys, which is known as the biggest overseas American military base. So all in all, I would have to say that South Korea's contribution has already been made reasonably and Trump's argument is ungrounded. So uh, South Korea's contribution is reasonable. The, the, the amount is, is not, uh, not that small, by and large, all in all. Now, Jessica, Trump has hinted at a possible withdrawal of U.S. troops if Korea doesn't pay more. Yeah. How do you gauge the possibility of that actually happening? Well, uh, ever since he began doing that under his previous presidency, there have been steps taken by Congress to limit his ability to do that quickly and suddenly. It is the presidential prerogative to withdraw troops. That is something that the U.S. president can do uh, without a lot of checks and balances. However, there have been some new checks and balances introduced through congressional action. In 2020 and 2021, during the National Defense Authorization Acts, uh, the, the Congress introduced the idea that the president would have to wait 90 days after uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense certifies to Congress that any withdrawal is within the U.S. national interest and will not harm the security of American allies. So that would be put into motion, presumably, if he were to um, attempt to withdraw troops from South Korea. And it's very unlikely, based on the current posture and the current position of the Pentagon, despite new political appointees at the top, that the strategy would change in terms of the intricacy of the alliances in uh, the region. I mean, we've seen uh, the Biden administration double down on the alliances with South Korea and with Japan in particular. Uh, and both of those countries, uh, from the U.S. perspective, have continued to operate um, at a greater level and a greater contribution to the regional uh, security initiatives that are taking uh, that are being taken by all three parties. And uh, a lot of uh, experts here in South Korea uh, echo your analysis, Jessica. They say that the uh, the actual possibility of Trump attempting to withdraw the U.S. troops from the Korean Peninsula is very low, and he's more likely uh, aiming to aiming to use it as a as a bargaining chip to make South Korea contribute more. Now, staying with you, Jessica, U.S. troops are also stationed in Japan, Germany, the Middle East, and many other parts of the world. What can you tell? Tell us about Washington's defense cost sharing with other countries. Yes, yeah, so I think this is a really interesting question and one that has not really occurred to most American citizens because part of the appeal of this political uh, messaging from President Trump uh, is that few Americans really understand uh, how many troops are ab abroad and how much and how they're paid for aside from the American taxpayer. So it's a compelling argument when you don't have all of the same all of the information. But to your point, uh, Japanese, the Japanese Constitution, as we know, after World War II, constrained the ability of the Japanese government to uh, draw up an army and to pay for uh, self-defense. So according to the Congressional Research Service, Japan is now paying two billion dollars a year to defray the cost of stationing u.s troops there uh, that is a fraction of course of what south korea is paying uh, they also pay for localities for hosting troops now in the case of a place like germany uh, where there have been u.s troops stationed for uh, a long time as well and there are american air force and army bases they are paying uh, just 118 million dollars to host foreign forces so Again, uh, uh, an even smaller fraction of what South Korea is paying. In terms of, uh, I think you asked about the Middle East, it's really hard to tell uh, how the U.S. is funding those troops. Many of those troops are on American bases um, or in, the, in, you know, in the, the sea, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, the U.S. Congress, of course, has pay, uh, passed recently $15 billion in military aid specifically to Israel. Most of that going to equipment and ammunition to restock the Iron Dome, for example, about 2.4 billion going to military operations in the region. And many of those directed at not only uh, keeping the conflict from spreading, but protecting U.S. investments and U.S. troops in the region. 
And Professor Pun, South Korea and the U.S. began their first round of defense cost sharing talks earlier than usual. They're normally held about a year in advance, but this time it came around 20 months ahead. Uh, what's behind this? Well, as you noted, when the new agreement is made, it will be applied uh, starting in 2026. So it is much earlier than usual for South Korea and the United States to begin the first round of defense cost sharing talks. If then, what drives it? First, the status of the rock us alliance seems to be considered. To be more precise, I would say that the current alliance status allowed the first round of talks to be made in advance. As of right now, the rock us alliance remains the most cohesive in history, as shown by the creation of the new type of extended deterrence called the NCG, Nuclear Consultative Group. When the alliance is more cohesive, they are more, more confident in reaching an agreement. So negotiation time has something to do with alliance robustness. The status of alliance cons, uh, cohesiveness matters, particularly when dealing with treaty issues like the uh, SMA. When the two allies are more cohesive, they are most likely to reach an agreement without a serious glitch because reciprocity is more expected. Second, I would say that uh, the South Korea and the United States wanted not to hinder a domestic variable from making the SMA deadlocked. For example, as uh, you mentioned earlier many, many times, and if Trump were returned to the over office, he is most likely to defi define alliances as a deal-making perspective rather than a security perspective. If it happens indeed, the SMA could be deadlocked from the beginning to top it off. If this situation happens, the long-standing alliance could be seriously challenged and North Korea could be more provocative while taking advantage of the stumbling Rock-US alliance. In this respect, both South Korea and the United States seem to consider many respects, uh, including a domestic variable, alliance maintenance, and even security when it comes to their decision to make these talks in advance. So a cohesive South Korea-U.S. military alliance, uh, the, the strongest perhaps uh, ever, and also Trump's possible return to the Oval Office, of course, were some of the factors uh, that uh, prompted South Korean and U.S. officials to meet earlier than usual for the defense cost sharing talks. Now, Jessica, what is the Biden administration's stance on the agreement? And, and would the two countries be able to reach a deal before the presidential election in November? Well, I think it's unclear whether they'll be able to do so. And there are obviously um, factors on both sides that will motivate and demotivate approaching that deadline. The Biden administration has not said that the November elections uh, are a hard deadline for them uh, at all. Of course, they'll still be in power until January when the new president is inaugurated, whether that's Biden or Trump. Um, what we do know is that if uh, that uh, we have a statement from the uh, State Department that says a senior advisor for security agreements at the State Department, Linda Specht, and you showed her picture earlier in the video. Uh, she's the woman with the wavy uh, hair, uh, about a shoulder length hair. And she says, quote, the United States seeks a fair and equitable outcome to the special measures agreement discussions for both countries that will strengthen and sustain the U.S. ROK alliance. So, not much more information than that. I think um, certainly plenty of analysts are reading into the timing of starting the talks early, um, but the incentives are, have definitely been altered because of the November election. Uh, that changes the calculation, of course, for Seoul as it does for Washington. Professor Pan, Trump, during his first presidency, demanded Korea bear an amount six times higher than the previous amount agreed. How do you see the chances of uh, Trump requesting a renegotiation, even if Korea and the U.S. strike a deal before the election and, and uh, if he gets reelected? Uh, to be honest, Trump is most likely to blame any deal made under the Biden administration and request a renegotiation even before the presidential election. This expected criticism was intended to raise awareness among American voters and make them support him. Furthermore, if Trump wins, he is most likely to directly order a rapid review to his step on the defense cost sharing agreement and then request a renegotiation re with South Korea in order to show he is a strong leader to the world as well as to South Korea. In addition, if he is reelected, he could 
for South Korea to bear not only five or six times higher amount than before, but even much more than that as part of the deal-making process. In the meantime, his transactional approach is focused more on ways or means than aims. I don't think he aims at, at uh, neutralizing the alliance inherently, but rather he seems to put more emphasis on highlighting the ways and means to maintain the alliance, alliance, which is more money. So if he were to return to the White House, he is most likely to request a renegotiation as part of the efforts to make his transactional approach fully functional. What matters is that although he might not neutralize the alliance at the end of the day, the alliance could be seriously damaged and stumbled in the process of an overly transactional approach, I think. And in related question, uh, Professor Pan, how should South Korea deal with the Trump variable in the defense cost sharing and also in other uh, risks surrounding the Korea-U.S. military alliance? First of all, South Korea needs to be well prepared regarding Trump's deal-making mentality. He wants to be a winner in all types of deal-making processes. Without understanding his mentality, it would be hard for the alliance to remain cohesive. For example, South Korea need, need to, uh, needs to make a, a detailed list of the deal-making that Trump might try. South Korea should uh, think about which one it can take from the United States in return for uh, its provision to the United States. In these deal-making processes, the highest level of communication matters because Trump prefers a top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach. So if, we, if he were to return to the White House, President Yoon would need to make individual communication with Trump strong in a timely manner. Second, Trump's return to the White House poses a great challenge to security in the region as well as security on the Korean Peninsula. Both North Korea and China are most likely to make the wrong U.S. alliance decoupling by carrying out a gray zone strategy. To top it up, North Korea could be more assertive, not only for nuclear coercion, but also for localized military provocations. So how to maintain deterrence in this stumbling alliance is going to be important. In this regard, self-help-based military readiness needs to be more highlighted than before, which includes a Korea-tailored three-axis system. Finally, other platforms than the bilateral architecture should be well-managed. For example, South Korea, the United States could be more communicative in the trilateral platform between South Korea, the United States, and Japan. Unilateral platforms that exclude the United States might be valuable as well to overcome the risks from the Trump variable. Asia Pacific 4 could be one of the examples of those architectures. Meanwhile, former Japanese Prime Minister Taro Aso held talks with Trump at the end of last month as Japan prepares for his possible return to the White House. Jessica, how is Washington perceiving this as well as other countries' similar meetings with Trump? Well, Professor Bond brought up a good uh, analogy when he talked about the personal connection that leaders need to have with the President Trump. And that's certainly something that Japan fully understood uh, even prior to him taking the presidency in 2017. Because in 2016, we know that Shinzo Abe, the former prime minister, now deceased of Japan, was the first foreign leader to meet with uh, uh, President uh, Trump, uh, even before he was officially inaugurated. And at the time, the two leaders did discuss the importance of the U.S.-Japan alliance. So uh, according to statements from the Trump campaign, and you're seeing the video there of um, the former Prime Minister Taro Aso meeting with uh, former President Donald Trump, uh, that issue was at the heart of their discussion when they met on April 23rd. Uh, Aso also accompanied um, Abe during many of his interactions. So uh, he is, to some extent, from the Trump campaign's uh, view, an extension of that administration. Uh, Trump has criticized Japan, like South Korea, for, quote, not paying its fair share of uh, its defense spending and for the, the presence of U.S. troops uh, in Japan. Uh, and Japan has already vowed to double defense spending by 2027. So, uh, you know, it's clear that there is the same kind of anxiety in the Japanese public that there may be in the South Korean public because there's this new term now, um, hobatora, or likely Trump, that is circulating. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a South Korean equivalent. 
Well, South Korea is uh, yet to hold high-level talks with Trump. But Dr. Bond, do you think Korea also needs a two-track approach and to, to more actively prepare for Trump's possible return? I would say that all governments should guarantee national security and protect their citizens from all possible challenges. To that end, the South Korean government should be well prepared for any contingencies. So a two-track approach might be inevitable to prepare for all contingencies. Meanwhile, uh, the, a two-track approach needs to be policed in two pillars. One pillar is based on the governmental level between the UN administration and the Biden administration. Two administrations need to make newly created platforms institutionalized in a timely manner, which includes the NCG and the rough US Japan security architecture. The second pillar is led by track two group, which is uh, led by retired diplomats, retired military officers, and civilian scholars. This track two group needs to be meet personnel from the Trump camp on a regular basis and hear policies under review from them. As this done, governmental specialists deliver leading results to South Korean government officials. These civilian groups could serve as an indirect communicator between the ROC government and the Trump camp. These types of indirect roles are expected to help the South Korean government be well prepared for the Trump con contingency. All right, uh, due to time limit, we'll have to leave things there. But um, Trump's possible return to the White House and its ramifications, it's uh, certainly uh, a very a key thing that South Korea is keeping closed tabs on. Thank you, Professor Ban and Jessica, for sharing your insights with us. Thanks for having me. And that brings us to the end of this show. Thank you for watching and be sure to tune in same time tomorrow to join our conversation. Goodbye for now.